welcome your host, John Coleman. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about uh, product backlog refinement in Scrum. Uh, product backlog refinement is an activity in the Scrum Guide, and my own personal opinion is it's almost recommended in the Scrum Guide. It's spoken about quite a bit. And when you get to multi-team Scrum, it's necessary. But I just want to give a little bit of a health warning here because the two best teams that I ever worked with didn't actually do product backlog refinement. They were Scrum teams. But I did have a big fail with one team in particular. I was at a sprint review and we went through the agenda of the sprint review, as you do. And at the end, someone said, why did you build this? We tried it last year. It doesn't work. And there was a collective head and hands moment. So that was a kind of reminder for me that it's important to talk to stakeholders, including real customers and end users, before you build something rather than after it. It's nice to show something at the sprint review, but in a sense, because Deficit of Done has such a high quality standard with the definition of done in terms of how we set our technical standards and product quality standards as well, then it's quite expensive to deliver things at Scrum. So maybe it's sensible to have a conversation before we actually build what we're being asked to build. So a lot of people think that really the product owner is there to clarify requirements. And the word requirement is a bit loaded because it means something is required. I believe Ken Schwaber mentioned at some point that a product backlog is a prioritized list of desirements. There's no such word as prioritized. The Scrum Guide changed a few years ago from saying the product backlog is prioritized to saying the product backlog is ordered to make allowances for what I call layer cake teams. Size of cake teams would probably still use the uh, expression uh, prioritized, but the Scrum Guide says ordered. But he also used the word desirement, which also doesn't exist as a word. But I hope you understand what he meant by that, that when you have product backlog items on a product backlog, we're indicating that we would like to have those items, but we will order the backlog. The product owner will order the backlog based on feedback uh, from the market and so on. And some items far down the backlog might get pushed down so much that they might never be delivered. Adding freshly cleaned plates onto a stack of plates, the old plates get pushed down. New ideas are usually much better than the old ideas. So really, instead of talking about the product owner clarifying requirements, really what we should be talking about is maybe we need to clarify problems that we're trying to solve. Maybe we need to clarify fleeting opportunities that we want to tap into so that the Scrum team can be clear on what we're trying to achieve. The 2020 Scrum Guide is very goal-oriented, which I welcome. So there's a product goal and there's a sprint goal, which is hopefully iterating towards that product goal. And there will be some product backlog items. Uh, a lot of product backlog items will be for the product goal. Not every item in the product backlog has to be for the product goal in the same way that not every item in the sprint has to be going towards the sprint goal. That said, we do need to clarify problems to solve and we need to clarify what opportunities we're trying to avail of. And so a lot of people think that's the product owner who does that. And I guess the product owner could do that and the product order is accountable that that happens. But I would hope that in most really good Scrum teams, the developers on the team, developer is an expression in Scrum to mean anyone who's basically doing work in the Scrum team. The developers would clarify the problems to solve, the opportunities to avail of directly with the stakeholders, including customers and end users. And Les is a bit more specific about this. The product owner acts as like a matchmaker between the developers and the customers and the end user developers meet stakeholders and they clarify what problems they need to solve together. They clarify the opportunities they're, they're trying to avail of. This can lead to uh, some problems because uh, some people are concerned that 
hang on a second, the product owner is ordering the backlog and has said no to some items in the backlog. And when some very clever stakeholders come along and the developers get asked to clarify problems A, B, and C, but the customer wants to talk about problems X, Y, and Z. I would have trained, and a lot of my peers as well as from the dog would have trained the developers to say, that's a really good idea, but you need to talk to the product owner. I'm here to clarify problems A, B, and C. And so we really do want to encourage the developers really understanding, getting a common understanding of what problems we're trying to solve, what opportunities we're trying to avail of. While you might have some people on your team who have very good skills with interviewing customers and end users, like UX professionals, for example, business analysts and so on, that's all very good. But what we don't want is a situation where one or two people have a very clear understanding of what problems we're trying to solve, but the rest of the developers and the team don't actually understand. And so we end up with some kind of version of that cartoon with the swing hanging off the tree where the swing isn't hanging off the tree. It's kind of lying down sideways off the trunk and where the customer isn't getting what they wanted. Actually, they're getting maybe five levels of translation removed from what they're actually looking for. So product backlog refinement is about getting a common understanding. And the Scrum Guide isn't prescriptive about what happens from there. I would hope what would be happening is we'd almost be treating it like Pac-Man, chewing down through the backlog and breaking items down so they're small enough to fit within a sprint. For the next two to three sprints, anyhow, we don't want to fully break down all of the product backlog because remember, some of those items at the bottom of the product backlog might never be delivered. I had one team in Ireland who did that once. They had a fully broken down backlog and I thought it was so wasteful because maybe they could have been working on validating stuff we'd already delivered and see to how we really solve problems. How do we attain a common understanding? Typical techniques would be maybe splitting product backlog items. I'm a personal fan of example mapping from behavior-driven development and specification by example, where you list out some examples that we need to deal with. And uh, what I love about examples is even if the team says we can't get this done within 30 days, Normally, we could say we can do this one first example in 30 days. And even though people think we have to do examples two, three, and four as well, I say to them, can you just do the first example? Can we just do that? And we just get some feedback because we've got all sorts of assumptions that we need to validate. Or they're really hypotheses. And we need to figure out if this is actually really what customers and end users really want. That's what they told us they want. But people know what they want when they see something. They also know what they don't want when they see what they ask for. At the sprint view. Also, it's uh, an opportunity for having a nerve center for discovery. If you have UX professionals in your team, maybe they could be leading uh, a UX part of uh, an agenda for product backlog refinement. If you had some kind of activity where you got together as a team and there's some normal refinement, so to speak, that you would have breaking items down, maybe doing some design, bringing people in to get things clarified. You might even come up with some short term solutions just to get some kind of feedback. And this is where the UX folks can go hand in hand with the non UXers in the team that maybe there are some ideas on a product backlog that should never be born. We think they're great ideas. I can tell you 90% of the ideas I come up with are wrong. Marty Kagan says a really good product manager, 70% of the items that a really good product manager would come up with are wrong. So we're wrong a lot of the time. So as it makes sense to do experiments, to maybe just meet some customers, find out what they want. There's a skill to doing interviews not leading the audience. Maybe we need to do some really cheap prototypes. Maybe as we get some evidence from those cheaper paper prototypes or low fidelity prototypes, maybe we could do some higher fidelity prototypes. Maybe we could do some Wizard of Oz experiment where it looks like it's all working, but really someone's pulling levers in the background and to make it all look like it's working. And we're, we're validating whether people would actually uh, use this product. We can also uh, get further into whether there's a product market fit, whether people might like it, but uh, would they pay for it? And would they pay what we need in order to make a commercial success of this? So product backlog refinement for me is crucial. Uh, even though two of the best teams I ever had didn't do it, even though they didn't do it, they spend a lot of time in their sprint planning, really understanding what problems they're trying to solve, what opportunities they're trying to avail of, also in the sprint review as well, when they met the stakeholders, they were really uh, trying to understand really, you know, just from straight from the horse's mouth, what was going on commercially and strategically and so on. And so they had they invested time in having really good detailed sprint planning events. And that's fine. 
but a lot of teams don't have the discipline to do that. And there's a bit of a risk as well with just exploring the detail in sprint planning, because if you leave it to sprint planning, potentially we could have a situation where uh, we're going to use the full eight hour time box for a one month sprint. And we might not have got through all the details. We might have something that's way too big, elephant sized. We might still decide to take it in to say we're going to do lots of refinement with the sprint and deliver some small amount of value for that during the sprint, but it's a bit more risky. What I prefer is that scrum teams do product backlog refinement on a regular basis. For me, once or twice a week, maybe one or two afternoons a week, make it voluntary basis, but representatives from each team would be there if you got a multi-team context. And you're, you're trying to do a Pac-Man job, breaking down what's coming next and understanding what's coming, on, coming up in the next two to three sprints. If you're in a context where you're depending on some other people who are not using Scrum or any form of Agile, maybe they're using Waterfall and you know, they've got a four month lead time or something like that to deliver their stuff. And then in practical terms, you might have to do product backlog refinement five months out because if you need to give those guys and gals four months notice, you need to do your homework to get ahead of those. And so you can try to build a better relationship with them where maybe we can do Agile together. So your look ahead will be dependent on who you're interacting with, but normally with really good teams, two to three sprints, two to three months, that kind of range looking ahead. So you're not arriving at sprint planning with your hands in your pockets, not really understanding what's coming up. You're almost bored with this, but you're now getting into the really specific details and some examples you're going to nail in this next sprint. I highly recommend it that the best teams, even though the two of the best teams I ever had didn't do it, I've worked with lots and lots of teams and I have noticed through some studies that teams who do very good for the backlog refinement there's a high correlation that they perform well. Uh, they have more successful planning because they better, they better understand what problems they're trying to solve, what opportunities they're trying to avail of. They tend to deliver on their sprint goals. They tend to iterate towards their product goal. They tend to have better engagement and connections with their stakeholders and better support from management because they really are doing their homework. They're not falling into this myth where we just arrive at sprint planning without having done any homework. We just do it just in time. So highly recommended. A couple of other things that I just want to mention because some of you are not using Scrum, you're maybe using Kanban. And so does Kanban have something equivalent? I can tell you that with the Kanban teams I work with, I've asked them to, to do product backlog refinement. But in Kanban per se, it's not really a thing that you do. What would be some of the equivalent things or, or close things, I guess, that happen in Kanban? One of the optional practices would be right-sizing. So right-sizing is where you look down to your product backlog and if you, sorry, if you have a product backlog, it's optional in Kanban. But whatever is coming up next, you say, is this, is this an elephant size? Can we fit this into a sp sprint or you're using Scrum or if you have a service level expectation in Kanban where maybe you, you finish most of your work in 16 days or less because you've got the data to support that. Now you've got a cycle time scatter plot, how long the work takes. Does this item feel like it fits within 16 days? And if it doesn't, you might need to break it down for if it's coming up soon. So right sizing is not quite like product backlog refinement, but it's about making sure that we're not bringing in elephants and we broke things down. But some discussion does arise from the right sizing because you try to obtain a common understanding of what you're trying to build. You might even come up with some experiments, just like you would do in product backlog refinement. And you might even involve some of the stakeholders, customers and end users in the same way that you would in product backlog refinement. So there are a lot of similarities, I would say. In addition, in TameFlow and in the 20th century Kanban, there's this concept of uh, full kitting. I don't mean to be disrespectful there. I actually really like full kitting in TameFlow. And what it essentially means is you're trying to line up all your ducks. Have we, do we really understand this work? Do we have some dependencies on other people? Have we set expectations with those people? But in addition, where what full kitting does is as I, I know you asked for this four months ago, but what problem are you trying to solve and what opportunity are you trying to avail of? Because I know what you wrote down, but I'd like to understand more what you really meant by that. And so lining up your ducks in all sorts of ways. And in Kanban, that makes a lot of sense, in my opinion, because I see a lot of teams, they start work that they know is going to get blocked almost immediately because they're sending it off to some supplier, some agency, some third party, some other company in the team, some other function or whatever. And they know that they're not ready. They haven't lined up their ducks. So I think that's a, it's a pretty good practice. So 
For me, product backlog refinement, thumbs up. Don't misunderstand it as just being something where you break things down. Don't misunderstand it as the product owner clarifying the requirements. Don't misunderstand it as the business analyst, if you have one, does it, or the UX person does it. I hope the entire team would be involved in this. In a multi-team context, you'd have representatives from, from each team talking, but ultimately there would be refinement at team level as well. If you do really good refinement, it basically... It means that you're going to have a smoother path. You're preparing the runway, so to speak, for the next uh, two to three spins or two to three months, depending on your context. And it really does help uh, things to go much more smoothly. In a Kanban context, if teams optionally do product backlog refinement or they do full kitting and right sizing in kind of similar ways to product backlog refinement, uh, it can relieve a lot of pain. And it can mean that when teams are doing just in time replenishment, when they're bringing the item in, they understand it better. Now, Kanban teams can also just refine it just in time. That's completely okay as well. It's just that if you're depending on some other teams who have long lead times or cycle times, that can be problematic. So just a bit of a health warning with that one. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. Thank you very much for your attention. 